Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. My name is Areej al -Zabardi, Content Marketing Executive at Erlang Solutions. Thank you for joining us today as we learn about how Eternity Blockchain is scaling smart contracts to interface with real-world data. We're honored to be joined by Eric Stenman, Erlang developer at Eternity, CEO at Happy Hacking, and former CTO at Klarna. This webinar is a continuation of a series of webinars run by Erlang Solutions highlighting the most innovative and exciting work in the Erlang and Elixir communities. Before we get started, we'd love to hear from you. You can tweet us using the hashtag Erlang Solutions Talks or submit a question in the Q&A for the Q&A session using the box on the platform. As a reminder, a recording of the webinar and the slides will be shared after this webinar has ended. Please keep in mind that this is a live event and that we may experience some technical issues, although hopefully not today. Now let's get started. Over to you, Eric. Thank you. Hi and welcome. Uh, today I'll talk about blockchains, eternity and smart contracts and all of this in the context, uh, context of Erlang. So Eternity is a new blockchain uh, where we will have smart contracts and be able to interface with real world data. So some background, what is a blockchain? Uh, a blockchain is a distributed ledger uh, and as the name blockchain implies, uh, it is a chain of blocks and each block contains a number of transactions and a transaction can transfer tokens between accounts. And an account is associated with a cryptographic key pair. So what is a block? Uh, this here uh, represents a block. Uh, a block has a header and a body. Uh, in this case, the header consists of a block hash and a previous block pointer and a root hash. I will explain what these are soon. And then a body of transactions. So this is block zero, also called the Genesis block. And here we have block one. So in the Genesis block, there is no previous block. And in block one, we have a pointer to the previous block. So this pointer has the hash of the first block. So this way, uh, all the blocks are connected in a chain. And since the block hash is a hash of all the fields in the block, uh, it uh, uniquely points out this. Uh, oh, I hope you have been seeing my screen. Uh, apparently, I just got the share screen here. So uh, I hope you all can see my screen now at least. Uh, so this is a block, block zero and block one connected in a chain through the previous block pointer. The root hash uh, is a hash of the state of all accounts after all the transactions in the block has been executed. So as we said previously, a, uh, a transaction can transfer tokens between accounts. So an account is an address in the uh, 
in the blockchain which contains tokens and these tokens can be transferred so each account has a uh, has a uh, an amount of tokens in it uh, in some blockchains like the bitcoin blockchain there are not accounts but instead there are unspent transactions so there's only transactions of tokens and these transactions can be spent and then they sort of not exist anymore and there's no balance on the accounts but in in the blockchain that we're building in eternity and the ethereum blockchain there are accounts with a balance and the root hash uh, is a hash of a structure way of seeing all the accounts and all their balances. So that way a block describes uh, the state of the whole world uh, as it is right now seen at, uh, in the blockchain. And since also the hash of the block contains the pointer to the previous block and all the transaction and the root hash. It means that there is no way to change a block without changing uh, the hash of the block. And changing the hash of the block would break the chain. So there's no way to, to change uh, any information in a blockchain. So what is mining? So each transaction that is uh, transferring tokens from one account to the other, uh, to another account has to be signed with the private key of the account that you're sending tokens from. So only the one that owns the account can send uh, tokens from that account. And miners, job is to check all transactions uh, before they enter the blockchain and they check that they are signed with the right key and the balance of the block is, of the account is large enough to contain uh, uh, so that you can actually transfer the amount that you want to transfer then when the miner has checked all the transactions and see that they are okay, they will be added to the block and then the miner will solve a puzzle. And this is also what's called uh, to mine the block, to find a hash for the block. And the first miner to solve the puzzle will get a minor reward and that block will be the, be the new top block of the chain. So if we look at this, um, uh, hash here, the block hash, it starts with a number of zeros. So this, this is the most usual way of uh, making the puzzle, finding how many zeros uh, the block hash has to start with. So the miner tries to find a solution to the block hash that results in uh, as many zeros as specified in the beginning. And it does this by adding a nouns uh, that he can decide what it should be and try different ones till he find a solution to the puzzle. And this nouns is also a part of the block. And miner gets tokens as a reward for uh, solving this puzzle but actually what you're rewarding the miners for is the checking that transactions are valid and signing off on this miner also gets uh, transaction fees from transactions so this way uh, you can use a blockchain in a distributed way in a safe way to transfer tokens between accounts. 
So what is Eternity then? Eternity is a new blockchain and it's designed to be efficient, to have transparent governance and global scalability. So with efficient, we want it to be uh, cheap to do transactions and be able to do many transactions per second. And with transparent governance, uh, the blockchain should be open and the users of the blockchains, the miners and the people who have accounts and tokens on the blockchain should be able to decide on uh, fees and how the uh, mining should work and things like this. And with global scalability, we also mean that we should be able to have uh, many, many transactions going through the blockchain. So the technology behind Eternity, uh, we use Erlang, uh, which is robust, robust, scalable, and allows us to do rapid development and has good operation and maintenance support. We also use Elixir uh, for really rapid prototyping and back and front end interfaces, testing out uh, new uh, features of the blockchain. And for the front end, we use um, JavaScript, Vue.js, HTML5, and so on. And most of the development is done on uh, HTML, on Ubuntu, and on GitHub. And everything is open source. So why would you want to use Erlang to build a blockchain? Uh, one advantage is that uh, with Erlang, it's very simple to build loosely coupled components and it simplifies parallel development and reuse. And this makes it easy to do flexible evolution. So we have been able to build a very basic blockchain and then evolve it uh, through iterations and been live with the testnet uh, for a couple of months now. Erlang also has concurrency done right, so it's easy to isolate like, the protocol from the program logic. So there is one part that talks to the outside world and other parts that decide what's happening on the server. And it's easy to, to handle protocols in Erlang. It has many features like uh, bit syntax and other things to make it easy to, to do protocol uh, development. And Ulf Wieger gave a whole presentation on the subject on why to use Erlang. Um, you can see it on the Eternity YouTube channel. The link is also here. So when you get the slides, you will be able to find it. Currently, the core Erlang team at Eternity uh, has more than 200 years of Erlang programming experience. So we have uh, people like Ulf Wieger, who has been programming Erlang since 93 or 94. And I myself has been programming Erlang since 94 and programming since uh, 1980. Uh, we have Jan Hughes, uh, who has worked uh, on Haskell and developed um, QuickCheck and a whole lot of other people with long Erlang experience. So this uh, makes development really fast and stable. So the biggest advantage, as I see it with Eternity, is that uh, Eternity is uh, the next generation of blockchain. So we had Bitcoin first, and then 
uh, came Ethereum, uh, which uh, provided smart contracts. And the number of things were implemented many times uh, in the smart contracts, things like oracles and uh, tokens. And what Eternity brings is to take these commonly used and very useful concepts and making them first class objects of the Eternity blockchain. So we have oracles, names, tokens, governance, state channels, and contracts. And I will talk a little bit about each one of them. So oracles. Oracles are used to bring in information from the real world. The data of an oracle is structured and data can be anything from a simple Boolean to the complete work of Shakespeare. So uh, when you create an oracle, you um, submit a transaction to the chain that says, I want to create an oracle. And uh, when you do this, you say what type of data uh, you're going to provide and the type of that data. Then uh, users can ask for this information and I as an Oracle provider can provide this data. And one of the types is of course string where you can put in uh, arbitrary uh, data, uh, unstructured uh, as an Oracle. We also uh, supply names, a way to give uh, understandable names for anything on the blockchains. So that is uh, uh, accounts, addresses, also oracles uh, and contracts can have names. So instead of having to talk about the hash, uh, which will be a very long sequence of letters and numbers, which is hard to remember and hard to talk about. You can actually assign a name and use that to talk about it. There are also tokens as first class objects. So tokens, can represent real world objects in some way. They can be created and destroyed and exchanged through atomic swaps. So uh, tokens can be used, for example, to represent some kind of digital content or represent a, uh, uh, a, a um, something in a game. Uh, they can be used for uh, doing, uh, minting a new uh, token uh, that uh, can be sold to raise fund for a project. And then these tokens can be uh, traded and transferred for uh, something uh, when the project is done. For example, if you uh, want to raise funds for making a new game, you can create a new token, uh, sell this token, use the money to, to uh, implement the game. And then people who has these tokens will get in-game features when the game is released or the game itself. So these are also first class objects. And then we have governance. Uh, so this is done by voting on the chain on government proposals. So uh, 
uh, that means that there is a way on the alternative blockchain to propose a suggestion and then vote on it. And this can be used uh, for other things than governance also. So governance and voting are first class objects on the chain. But it can also be uh, used to decide on uh, minimal fee for transactions or uh, what the uh, minor reward should be. Then we also have state channels uh, and state channels is a way to scale uh, the chain. So by having state channels, not all transactions need to be done on the chain. So you start a state channel and you agree with someone else uh, to put some uh, tokens into this channel. So each of you put a number of tokens into the channel and then you can uh, do uh, transactions off the chain and both sign each transaction. Um, so one example is that uh, I want to buy coffee and you have a coffee shop. I open a uh, state channel to you and I put in 100 tokens and then every time I want to buy a to yeah, coffee, I, I say that now the balance is that you have one of these tokens and I have 99 and we both sign up off on this and I get my coffee. And the next time I buy coffee, I say that the balance is 98 and to me and two to you and we sign off to this. And then at some point we can close the chain and then you will get those two tokens and I will keep my 98 unused tokens. And um, uh, with state channels, you can do uh, transactions such as uh, paying for each frame of a streaming video broadcast, for example. So this can be fully automated and means that you, you don't pay upfront for the full movie. If uh, for some reason the transaction is interrupted, uh, then you have only paid a few uh, microtransactions for getting a few frames over. And this would not be possible with the uh, doing on the chain because transactions will cost more on the chain and they will always take some time for the chain network to confirm the transaction. And all these first class objects uh, can be used in smart contracts. So some people have said that smart contracts are neither smart nor contracts, but actually they're just code that can execute on the chain. So uh, the code execution is deterministic and the outcome is verified by minor. The execution of the code can alter the, alter the state of the chain. So it can transfer tokens between accounts and it can do all the things uh, that you can do on the chain. So on the Ethereum chain, uh, on the Eternity chain, you can actually create oracles and look up oracles and so on. So that's what we're going to talk about now, contracts. So when we dis design the contract language and the virtual machine for uh, uh, Eternity, we had four goals. We wanted contract execution to be safe. Uh, we wanted it to be efficient and scale, and we wanted it to be cheap. And there should be a simple way to migrate from Ethereum smart contracts.
So the first go contract execution should be safe. Uh, I think we all have heard uh, about some of the contracts on Ethereum where money has been locked in or stolen because of bugs in the contract. So we want uh, the contracts to be safer. And we do this by giving you a possibility to uh, state properties of the contract and actually prove these properties. So we have designed a new functional language called Sophia and a new si safe virtual machine, FTWVM. I will talk more about both of them in a while. The second goal is that contract execution should be efficient and scale. So in order to achieve a scalable solution, Eternity provides state channels and a new consensus algorithm. So we hope to have uh, Bitcoin NG implemented uh, soon, uh, which should uh, increase uh, the number of transactions that can be done on chain. And since we have state channels, we can do many transactions off chain. And this should help with the scalability of the chain. But to get efficient contract execution, we also designed a new high level language. Uh, and uh, then we are building an efficient machine for more complex contracts uh, that also should be executing fast, but not as fast as the very high level language. The third goal is that contract execution should be cheap. So the price of contract execution will of course be determined by miners who decide whether they want to pick up a contract and run it at what price and by the users by deciding how much they are willing to spend on getting a contract to execute. So uh, with an open uh, blockchain that is fully decentralized, there is no way to, to control the price really. So the price will be determined by the users in the future. But uh, by having state channels and efficient ways to execute contracts. And for the high level language, a simple flat rate uh, for contracts. We hope that prices should be uh, kept low. The fourth goal was that there should be a simple way to migrate from Ethereum smart contracts and uh, uh, by providing a version of the Ethereum virtual machine, it should be easy to migrate EVM contracts to Eternity. So to recap the goals, uh, safe, efficient, scalable, cheap, and easy way to migrate. Of course, um, these four goals are not very easy to combine. Uh, and to get all of them to work at the same time. So we decided to not try to do that because that would probably uh, fail miserably. So instead we have um, decided to do three different uh, virtual machines. So uh, by having a version of uh, EVM, uh, it's easy to port Solidity contracts uh, from Ethereum to Eternity. So it should be possible to use existing popular contracts uh, on the chain and also in order to test the performance uh, of Eternity and find bottlenecks before 
main launch. We have made some alterations to the EVM. Uh, one thing is a safe self-destruct instruction. So the um, contracts will not be removed until they are no longer used. We're using a different hash, so that is a change in the EVM. Uh, we'll add subroutines that are coming to the EVM and bit manipulation instructions that's probably coming to the EVM and also uh, instruction for accessing more than 16 stack positions uh, since our functional language that also compiles to the EV, uh, Eternity EVM uh, needs to be able to access a lot of stack positions. So in order to achieve goal one, the safe contract language, uh, we provide a new language called SOFIA. SOFIA is a type functional programming language. Uh, it's a dialect of ML, uh, very close to reason, uh, but with uh, significant byte space. And SOFIA can be compiled to a safe virtual machine, FTWVM. And SOFIA provides ways to define properties about functions and contracts. And these properties can be proven to hold or disproven, which would result in a compile time error. So uh, then you cannot actually create uh, the bytecode for a contract that doesn't fulfill its uh, properties. A SOFIA contract might look like this. It's uh, typed, so you have type event, you have type state, which is a record uh, with the field data, which is an unsigned integer. Uh, we have the init function, which takes an unsigned integer and returns a state. And here uh, it sets the field data to the value of value. Note that the uh, curly brackets here are not uh, function body brackets. Uh, it's uh, brackets around uh, the record. So the function get that only access the field in the state doesn't use any curly brackets at all. And then we have a set um, that um, change the state. Uh, this init function is executed uh, at contract creation and sets the state to an initial value. And the set function is a way to update uh, the state and the state is a field in uh, the returning argument of uh, this contract. Uh, we can call other contracts. Um, so there will be a, a raw call uh, built in that calls an address on the chain, another contract address. You give the function name, how much gas you want to give, uh, how much uh, value transfer you want to do, and then any arguments to the, to the main function that you're calling. So this uh, call syntax is very recent and we're experimenting with it right now. So this might not be the final version. The SOFIA compiler is typed and keep tracks of types all the way down to the FTWVM code. So the functional type warded virtual machine 
is a high level virtual machine uh, with uh, a variable world length and an associated memory. So it's functional, that is the data is tagged, it has automatic memory management and associative memory also. It's typed, so all instructions and memory positions are typed and tagged uh, in the machine code also. And it's uh, what normally would be called checked, uh, but we call it boarded in order to get for the win virtual machine, uh, not FTC VM. So all instructions are checked at runtime for overflow, underflowed types, uh, and so on. And the instruction cost of the machine uh, will be controlled by governance. So if it's determined that some uh, instructions in the machines uh, cost too much or too little compared to uh, the time it takes to execute them, this can be changed uh, easily dynamically on the chain. Our second uh, language, um, Varna, um, after another Bulgarian city, or also Sanskrit for type. It's a more like a scripting language, similar to the Bitcoin script language. There is no loops, um, and the gas cost is decided at compile time. So this might, of course, uh, be a slight overestimation in some cases, but uh, you will know exactly how much your uh, gas you will need for for a, a contract and miners will know how much uh, gas they will get for a contract. So now we come back to the power of um, the first order objects. So since uh, uh, attorney has all these first order objects, the Warna language is still very powerful. So uh, here we have an example of a Warna contract uh, where you want to buy some tokens of some um, uh, uh, designed tokens that are created on the chain previously. So you're buying them for a certain value. And there is an oracle um, that provides the game token current price. So by calculating how much, um, how many Aeon tokens you're sending in and the price of the game tokens, you get an amount of tokens that uh, you can afford to buy. So then if you have uh, uh, the owner has that many tokens um, and the caller, uh, then the caller tokens is increased by that amount and the owner tokens are decreased by that amount and the owner's balance is increased by the value. So um, with this simple contract, you can still buy uh, referring to oracles and tokens, you can actually uh, do uh, quite advanced uh, contracts without loops or things like this. These contracts are compiled to the high level machine, uh, HLM, we might come up with a better name at some point which is a very simple virtual machine. Uh, and actually they are just evaluated directly by the node uh, as part of uh, verification of uh, block transactions. Not a real separate uh, virtual machine. It's sort of the language that uh, uh, transaction verification uh, is written in. 
but it has a basic like syntax that is compiled to and coded as uh, bytecode stored uh, on the blockchain. And uh, this uh, code looks something like this, and hopefully uh, not something anyone will have to look at ever. So um, Eternity is a new blockchain with first class objects. Why do we have three different languages and virtual machines? So we have Sophia and for the Win virtual machine for safe system level programming where you can create new, uh, more complex uh, objects on the chain. We have Varna and the high level machine for day to day fast contracts. And we have Solidity and EVM or AEVM for porting all contracts to them, um, to Eternity. So Eternity is all open source. Uh, you can find it at GitHub uh, at slash Eternity. And um, you can see the development going on there uh, daily. Uh, and you can uh, see the contract languages and, and everything uh, in the Epoch project under Eternity. So that's about it. And um, I'll open up for questions. Thank you very much, Eric, for that very insightful and in-depth um, overview of your work with Eternity Blockchain. Um, as Eric said, we'll be opening the questions and answer session now. And to kick off, we have a question from Christian who says, Following on the state channel communication off-chain off and on the chain being recorded as just a final balance, um, where are persisted, where are the off-chain transactions persisted? Um, so they're, they're only persisted in the closing channel uh, transaction. So it, it will be up to uh, the two parties of the chain to keep track of any intermediate state of that chain. Uh, there will also be a possibility to have a smart contract that resolves uh, the final state of the uh, of the uh, of the channel, but of course the input to that. Um, contract has to be signed by both parties and they will have to keep um, track of uh, this data. So there will be proxy servers that take care of communication between parties in state channels. You can, there's an open protocol for doing this so you can write your own, uh, but it will be uh, up to the endpoints to somehow keep track of the, the state until they actually close the channel. Okay, thanks for that, Eric. The next question comes from Ali, and he says, who or which machines execute oracles, and are they also distributed? So uh, oracles do not really execute as machines. Uh, so the oracles, uh, are um, living off chain and um, they can subscribe to a web socket and find requests for Oracle answers. And when they find such a request, uh, they post the answer to the chain and they can be paid a fee for, for this service by the requester. So, the implementation of, of the Oracle is done in, in any language uh, outside. You can write it in, in Visual Basic or Python or uh, whatever you want. 
Thanks for that, Eric. Um, another question from Ali. He says, could you talk more about testing Varna Sophia code? Uh, test, uh, what's it about testing the code? Yeah, testing Varna Sophia code. So uh, I'm not sure whether the question means uh, the ability to test it yourself right now or how it will be tested by us. Uh, so, uh, the uh, virtual machines and the compilers are still under development. There are some branches you can find uh, in the uh, Eternity GitHub uh, where you can uh, try things out. You can compile very simple uh, Sophia contracts and run it on the testnet as it is right now, uh, but uh, the interaction with the chain is not uh, on the testnet yet. It will probably be within uh, two to four weeks, um, and uh, then you should be able to, to try out more um, contracts, both um, Solidity and Sophia contracts. The Varna contracts might be a bit longer before they are uh, online. And uh, our testing of the contracts, uh, we um, have the Cubic team with us, uh, which can do property-based testing. So we will have uh, many nice property-based testing uh, tests for uh, uh, contracts. Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, I'd like to remind everyone at this point that you can still submit questions if you have any um, in the question box. Um, on to the next question from Thanos. He's asking, do you have any customers or use cases in finance that you can mention that are planning to try your Chan? Uh, so I'm completely on the development side and I do not really know uh, kind of customers uh, we have. So you would have to ask uh, that question on the Eternity uh, uh, channels that you can find from the Eternity web page. Of course, and we'll be sharing the Eternity details in the follow-up email after this webinar. Um, next question from Grigory says, do you have any samples of contracts to look at and test network for testing them? The test network is up and running and in uh, the source code uh, on GitHub, uh, there are a few uh, contracts under uh, Epoch app um, uh, Eternity Epoch apps and Sophia is uh, still in the source code called Ring for historical reasons will soon change name to Sophia. There's test contracts and there are a number of contracts there. Um, so um, you can find them. Uh, some of them can be submitted to the testnet and run. Some of them are still two to four weeks away before they will actually work on the testnet fully. Thanks for that, Eric. Um, next question from Thanos. How would you compare this chain to Hyperledge or Fusion? Uh, I don't know enough about Hyperlint or Fusion to, to really answer that. That's fine. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Uh, we have a question from Andrew next. What other information resources are available for Eternity and Erlang integration, such as videos or blogs? Uh, so Eternity has a, um, a YouTube channel and a web page um, and there you can find um, some talks about it. Uh, and on um, 
GitHub, the Trinity, there is a uh, repository called uh, Protocol, which uh, uh, tells you all the details about how uh, the Trinity talks to the outside world. Uh, and there's also in Epoch some readmes and um, getting started uh, introductions to to set up uh, your own node and connect to the testnet. Thanks for that, Eric. Um, next question: Will it be possible to call contracts in one language from contracts in another language? Yes, that's the plan. There will, of course, uh, be some restrictions uh, depending on types. So uh, the types and the data types and um, in the different languages will be slightly different. So um, you have to uh, have functions that um, have an interface that is compatible. So calling calling uh, functions that take addresses on the chains and that takes integers um, should work between contracts. Calling with different types of record structures, these will probably be different between different languages. Um, and uh, then you will get uh, type errors uh, at um, either compile time or uh, run time. Um, so since you can also refer to, to contracts by name and names might actually change, uh, you can decide whether the name should be uh, dereferenced at compile time or run time. So you might want to refer to the latest version of a named Oracle, for example, or a specific version. Uh, so this means that you can get some runtime errors if you're trying to call a, a contract that doesn't have the, the right uh, function or right type. But um, for simple calls, uh, the plan is that it should be possible to call between, uh, between different languages and that there will be simple marshalling of uh, similar types like addresses and integers and so on. Brilliant. Um, on to the next question. Can you resolve a state channel with a smart contract? That's the plan, yes. So the first uh, implementation of state channels that are uh, coming in the next few sprints, we work in two-week sprints, where one sprint is ending um, uh, today, tomorrow. Uh, there are uh, some parts of state channels coming in there, but not a full part. And the first version will only uh, be uh, without smart contracts, but in the final version, uh, you should also be able to uh, have a smart contract that uh, resolve uh, the state channel on closing. And then you, the state that you sign would be the the arguments uh, to to use uh, to that smart contract when closing. Okay, thanks, Eric. Um, and then, unless anyone else has any more questions, this may be the last question. Um, how is the fee for a Varna contract calculated? Uh, so, sort of in a similar way as uh, for. Ethereum, uh, but not at runtime. So each type of uh, instruction will have a cost, uh, and this cost can be decided by governance, but there will be a starting cost uh, defined for each type of instruction. And then the longest or the most expensive uh, if or case branch uh, of the contract uh, the cost of that one will be uh, used. So try not to write uh, very unbalanced smart contracts that has 
one branch that does very little and another branch that does a lot of work, especially if the branch that does very little work is the one that most often is executed. Um, so there will be um, a uh, the maximum cost. Uh, so there are ways to to uh, avoid this problem by breaking things up into smaller units, but uh, we think that this will uh, work out fine in most cases. But of course, if you have an upper bound, uh, there will be places where you will lose out as a caller. Okay, thank you very much, Eric. Um, I think that draws a close to our Q&A session. Um, thank you everyone for attending and special thanks to Eric for joining us, sharing your time and your expertise on this subject with us. It was a very insightful session. Um, this session was recorded, so it will be shared with everyone after the session in the next few days. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.